Okay, so uh, <clears throat> today we'll talk about two architects, uh, Hans Hollein, um, happy birthday to you, sir, and uh, Lloyd Wright. Actually, uh, I, I'm a little bit confused because they are not both born on the 30th. One is born on the 31st, and I made a mistake. I mean, I have his name. I think, uh, I think either, well, I don't know. Either Hans Hollein was born on the 31st of March, not on the 30th, or uh, Lloyd Wright. One of them. I discovered this just before I began, I began, uh, I, I started the Zoom. But it's not, I don't think it's a big, uh, it's a big crime. Because tomorrow, anyway, it's uh, Dame Zaha Hadid, and I simply cannot, uh, uh, find room for uh, anyone else near her, unless that someone else is Lina Bobardi, but Lina Bobardi uh, is not born, was not born on the 30th uh, or on the 31st of March. So Hans Hollein, 1934-2014. Uh, Hans Hollein, yeah, he was born uh, today. So it means um, um, Lloyd Wright was born on the 31st was an Austrian architect, Hans Hollein, and designer and key figure of postmodern architecture. Some of his most notable works are the Haas House and the Albertina extension in the inner city of Vienna. I don't know. I mean, yes, there are so-called postmodern elements in his architecture, but I think he transcends postmodernism. Here, here he was. Um, well, I, I, I obviously have deficiencies in my uh, in my knowledge system, but I think he received the Pritzker Prize, didn't he? Anyway, it it, it, it doesn't matter so much, but uh, I think he did. Uh, you can tell on his face, actually, his face does tell, does say something about his architecture. Uh, if you look at it, and if you could decipher his uh, uh, facial uh, facial mask. If it is a, a, a facial mask, I particularly like this picture of him. You know, a little younger, and uh, but but his face, his facial expression says a lot, in my opinion. His architecture is exactly like his facial expression in this um, in this uh, in this picture. An interesting and complex man. And here he is in an older age. I understood he suffered a number of years before he died. He was ill, uh, severely ill, but um, a, a force, a force in the in the Austrian uh, architecture uh, field. Uh, no, not only Austrian. Austria being, uh, uh, despite the fact that it is uh, its population half the size of uh, the population of Romania, uh, the architecture and art is uh, is very very accomplished. Drawing some drawings by Hans Hollein. Uh, he he did drawings, uh, some of them of a highly uh, poetical or uh, visionary nature. Um, he drew well uh, manually. He I don't think he he employed the computer. Uh, some of his works, in my opinion, do have a um, a twisting, uh, kind of a humorous uh, stance. Um, but but not all of them, and so he he is truly an architect difficult to to um, pin down, so to speak. I mean, you look you look at this drawing; it's a sculpture, but maybe he did it for a building. It's possible. He was very very explorative, and um, as such, I think he was an inspiration and is an inspiration. I mean, you know, even this kind of, of drawing, it shows his artistic ability. Uh, uh, and, um, you know, he's very, very diverse um, interests. Austrians in general are interesting because I think uh, it's not an accident that uh, psycho psychoanalysis was born there or in Vienna. I think it is a country of contradictions and even conflicts and inner conflicts, that is. And, and, and those are very productive for creativity.
Okay, now we begin with this candle shop, a candle shop from 1964-1965 in Vienna, this uh, incredible city, which can be very conformist, but also very non-conformist. Uh, it's, it's a famous, uh, it's a famous uh, work which was published, uh, you know, in the 60s and 70s uh, in all architecture magazines. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's, you know, exquisite. You know, it's like a jewel store, you know, and uh, he has, a, you will see another jewel store. You know, if you look on the left and you look on the right, this facade, you know, has something enigmatic and it's certainly uh, individualized by uh, a, a concern with, uh, with design. He was a designer, he was an architect, he was a designer, he was an architect, he was both. He designed everything, you know. So in this, you can see his um, aptitude towards, towards design. That's how he began with small works, but he arrived later at, at larger works uh, since uh, he was uh, successful. And, uh, you know, this is a, a, a great uh, opportunity for young architects. You know, you just uh, remodel a small uh, store uh, well, you know, I'm sure it's not so easy to find a job with, uh, you know, high, uh, uh, you know, uh, financial uh, power. But, you know, even with smaller means, uh, I think uh, a lot can be done. The idea is to be creative. And he was creative and he made the noise, so to speak, with his creativity. Here it is a, a, a drawing he made with the facade of this, um, this building. Um, yes, it was an architecture, uh, you know, I don't know if he did his drawing in the 60s, when, when he was, uh, you know, uh, when he built it, I mean, in the 60s, uh, I don't know, but who cares? We go now to New York from Austria, from Vienna, we go to New York and uh, here it is, uh, an art gallery. I don't know, I mean, you know, it seems he had success rather quickly because he arrived, at maybe that person, and I think this is the case, uh, was Austria, you know, Feige, and, uh, you know, commissioned Hans Hollein. But why did he commission Hans Hollein and not another architect? Because if you are creative, if you are even idiosyncratic, if you are, if you are intense, you, are, you, are, you bring something new, of course you, 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 you you provoke uh, others to, to look with interest towards your work. That's why he was invited. But if you do a work which is not identifiable easy, easily, a work which is, doesn't have personality, which doesn't bring anything new, don't expect people to search for your name and to contact you because it will not happen. That's why I keep telling the students and the arca young architects and even to those who are not young any longer, create, you know, uh, truly creative works, then, you know, uh, uh, clients might come in, but you have to bring in something new. Otherwise, why would they come to you? I think anyone who wants to pay for a building wants something different, wants something special, even those with low budgets. Why would one invest in a mediocre work, in a work which is uh, not saying anything? Why? I think even those less ambitious do want something special for the money they spend. That's what I think, it's normal. So here it is uh, the building in New York City where Hans Hollein had the chance to create, um, you know, uh, remodel uh, an art gallery uh, and uh, he did it. It's very important because if you have commissions, you know, here he had a commission in Vienna, a commission in New York, all of a sudden, of course, he, uh, you know, he uh, made waves, so to speak, and became known. <clears throat> and this is, <clears throat> this is how you build a reputation. Now, of course, from building a reputation and keeping it uh, is a long distance sometimes. You have to be careful not to destroy what you what you built. But look at the look at the entrance into the building. This also is like his face; is a little bit enigmatic. 
it's symmetrical and it's not symmetrical. It's a broken symmetry. And uh, here already, you know, we have a, a glimpse at what uh, Hans Hollein was about. Uh, scenes from the, you know, the opening, I guess, uh, uh, is this Andy Warhol? I don't see very well with my glasses, but whatever. <clears throat> it's uh, the commotion of the high uh, life of uh, New York City. Now, 1972, 74, this is a very important work, little work, but very important in terms of quality. And architecture is about quality, it's not about quantity. Well, you know, maybe ideally it should be about quality and quantity, but mainly it's about quality, not quantity. And this is a little work, a little shop, a jewelry shop right in the center of Vienna, but look at it. <laughs> now, of course, the rationalists would protest. What is this nonsense here? Why did he do this? And why didn't he do it the other way? Could you please tell us, Mr. Hans Hollein, why didn't you, you, you do it? Why did first? Why didn't you use the? Why didn't you use the T square and the rectangle? What is this nonsense here? <laughs> but you know, Hans Hollein would probably smile enigmatically and say, "Who knows what?" I can. I have my own interpretation. Art and architecture also has have subjectivity. Uh, so has you know it, it, this this. Um, um, you know, break into the facade, this um, wound of the facade in a way. Who knows, it could symbolize many things. It also functions for these pipes, which are also um, considered sculpturally. So he, he used, uh, uh, you know, a, a technical uh, element of the building to enhance the sculpturalness and the, the artistic quality of, of, of the building. And you know, I mean, look at the door. Look at this. I think it's beautiful. And again and again, it's about expressing emotions, expressing art, expressing inventiveness, expressing creativity, being even a little bit crazy. You know, it's good cool to be crazy. That's why I keep telling the students here, be pocatos. Yes, yes. <laughs> Uh, do a sinful architecture. Don't be, you know, well behaved and all that nonsense. You know, all the great creators were actually sinners, all of them in the field of architecture. Uh, and some of them, and maybe many of them, even outside of architecture. And look at what these men did here. I think it's beautiful again. And it's beautiful, you know, 50 years, half a century later. Now, if some people call it uh, postmodern, they could. I wouldn't call it postmodern. No, it's, you know, it, it's a small space. Look at this. You know, this is a chair. I mean, you can imagine. I don't know if there are uh, dimensions here, but it, it's a very, I mean, look, this is the entrance door. So it's less than three doors wide, the shop. But this is one of the best uh, known works, architectural works uh, in the 70s uh, in Europe and worldwide. Uh, look at the section. Is this a big uh, volume? No, I mean, look, this is two meters and 11. I mean, it's very tiny, but qu qualitatively it's not tiny at all. It is indeed a jewel. It's a jewel box for a jewelry, for a jewelry store. And it's, uh, it's exquisite, like a jewel has to be. And indeed, as John Ruskin said, the most beautiful things in life are those which are uh, the most useless, like the, the peacock's tail and the, and the lily. You know, like this thing, this is the, the least, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's it, it, yes, it, you could force some function, I guess, you know, but for the pipes, but all in all, it's capricious. It's, it's, it has to do with aesthetics and it has to do with the sensitivity and the mood of the architect when he began to draw on the paper. The interior, well, what can we say? It's a very small space, but uh, 
again, you don't need a big space to, to make a statement, to make a splash. And this is the, the, the door. <laughs> you know, again, the, the, the common architect who might not deserve the name architect uh, or the title uh, would, would say why, uh, what, what kind of a door this is, you know, why, why is it this way? <laughs> anyway, a museum, 1972, 1982, all of a sudden large spaces, a big vista, landscape and all the rest. Is this a postmodern? I think it has maybe very, very slight elements of postmodernism, but I think it transcends the, the limits of what we call postmodernism. It's a very fine museum by Hans Hollein. And uh, I hope I have better pictures, but um, I'm not very happy with them. The, the, the plan has, uh, I, I've heard the, if you ask, if, if you are so kind, please turn off the microphone unless you want to say something. Thank you. So you look at the plan, there are elements of organization, of strict organization, but there are also elements of a certain freedom. freedom. Uh, so it's order and disorder, talking about the conjunctio oppositorum, which the, uh, the, the, the Viennese, the Austrians seem to know something about and good for them. I, it, it's an excellent architecture, exactly because it escapes, you know, the, the, the easily decipherable stylistic elements. You know, it, it's, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't call it uh, uh, postmodern, no, no. Unfortunately, unfortunately though, uh, what he built uh, across the Piazza Plaza from uh, St. Stephen's Cathedral, that building, yes, as elements of what we call postmodernism, but a little bit less here or almost not at all here. He was a sophisticated European architect who understood that he cannot just, uh, you know, uh, use uh, Doric columns and all the rest, although we know that Adolf Loos used the model of a Doric column for the a famous um, competition in Chicago for the Chicago Tribune Tower, which became in the hands of um, Adolf Loos, a Dory column. And by the way of this, I, I will soon invite you because I want to launch a competition. This year, there are 100 years. So it's the centennial, the centennial of the that very famous, truly very famous and deservedly so, uh, international competition for the Chicago Tri Tribune Tower. It happened in 1922 and now it's 2022, exactly 100 years later. Uh, at that time, very important architects uh, participated. Uh, the competition was uh, won uh, by uh, Raymond uh, Hood and his partner. I, I will never memorize his name, but uh, that's not a crime because the work was actually done by uh, the young, unknown Raymond Hood, um, and uh, they built the, the tower. But uh, there were the great works by El Eliel Sarinen, by uh, uh, Bruno Taut, uh, Max Taut, uh, Walter Gropius. Everybody participated in that competition. And I want to launch now, by the way, of the centennial another competition, maybe called a tower for cities and Kane. I wrote already the text because I think we live in a di very different time. Uh, you know, a skyscraper, it's very easy to build these days. There are so many skyscrapers, taller and tall, taller, more and more extravagant, World Trade Center, then uh, the Arab world, the China. Hey, you know, a skyscraper is not a, a mystery any longer, it's not a surprise any longer. The world has lots of skyscrapers, but I think we need a different kind of verticality because 
we, we cannot go on like this to build taller and taller and to consume the resources of the earth and so on. But maybe we need um, a moral verticality or emotional verticality, or maybe no verticality at all. Because I saw that the tower, I think there is a dichotomic pair. The tower, what complements the tower? Probably the cave, the cave and the tower. So maybe, and also significantly while, um, and sorry for this digression, but it is somehow related to, to, to what we are going to talk uh, even uh, in this presentation. Uh, if you think about it, the Chicago Tribune was built for a news, news, newspaper. It was a tower for a newspaper, just as it was the Times Tower in New York City, also for a newspaper, uh, the New York Times. But today, the, the big forces in media built horizontal buildings like the Apple, uh, you know, the, the Apple uh, headquarters, the Facebook book, uh, headquarters, and the Google uh, headquarters. They don't have towers, but they extend it horizontally a lot. Anyway, sorry about this. Let's look at the museum by, um, by uh, uh, Holein, Hans Holein. Uh, the interior is as it is. I think the interior has elements of what we might call postmodernism, uh, even these steps on the round here. There is a little bit of, uh, of uh, disputable uh, softness, but towards the outside, uh, even this industrial look uh, or in rhythm, I think, uh, makes it escape the, the being uh, doomed by uh, what we call postmodernism. It's a modern building. I wouldn't call it postmodern. Glass and ceramics house in Tehran, in Iran. Yes, Iran has this house by Hans Holland, 1978. Uh, 1978. Um, I also, um, I was told today by Natalia, one of the two Natalias who are here today uh, told me that um, Indeed, in Budapest, uh, Grimshaw uh, won the competition for a subway station, a railway station in, in Buza, Budapest. Truly, uh, the, uh, even our neighbors are investing in good architecture coming from other, other architects. So I wonder why Romania is not doing something like this, you know, because the money is, is here. I don't think Iran was much richer than us or uh, Hungary uh, more than us. It's a different mentality. They are open. Well, Iran is not. But even Iran, you know, look, in 1978, 1978, well, is this building which is old, but the inside was um, refurbished by him. This is, yeah, you could say it's, it's postmodern. And he tried to echo, you know, certain things from the, the Iranian culture, I guess. Um, not everything he did, in my opinion, is truly great. Uh, maybe when he allowed the designer to take over the architect, maybe he's a little uh, problematic. But he's always interesting. Hans Hollein is always interesting. It's theatrical, it's rhetorical, it's provocative, it's idiosyncratic. Um, so he makes a statement. He makes a splash. Hans Hollein. Now, this is a school in Vienna, 1979, 1990. You have to understand this was the time when postmodernism was um, ruling the world. And uh, that was very unfortunate because even Ken, uh, Ken Gokuma uh, collapsed, uh, not that he succumbed, he actually collapsed when he designed a horrible, horrible, horrible showroom for, the, for Mazda. Uh, Maybe you know it. In my moments of despair and uh, discouragement and uh, maliciousness, I, I even wrote about this. I said, I'm surprised the J Japanese didn't uh, remove his right to build after he built that thing. I'm talking about Ken Gokuma. This is a sketch for, uh, for, this, uh, for this building is here. It's the school by Hans Holland. Well, uh, you know, uh, quite a school, especially if you look at this uh, part uh, in, the, in the courtyard. 
uh, yeah, this I would say is um, has elements of uh, you know uh, what we call postmodernism. But the intentions are still good with a courtyard, with a tree in the center, uh, which I hope uh, grew uh, since uh, the picture was taken. Shoeless. The schools. The ping pong tables. The picnic table. <laughs> I mean, both tables are very uh, appealing to me. Again, formal capriciousness. Yesterday, I found out that the director, uh, an art historian actually, who founded uh, from scratch, it's from nothing, uh, the Skyscraper Museum in New York. She published a book called Form Follows Finance. We usually say form follows function. She wrote form follows uh, finance, meaning money. Uh, but there are many permutations between, um, well, between form and something else or function and something else. Like Bernard Chumi said, the form follows fiction, meaning function is fiction. Uh, Louis Kahn said form evokes uh, function. Uh, and uh, in a cynical uh, mood, I wrote somewhere that function follows form. But, uh, you know, uh, the relationship between function and form is uh, always uh, complex, but there is a relationship between them, yes. Now, an apartment, apartments in Berlin, uh, it was this very interesting uh, action that Berlin took in, you know, in the 80s, when just like they did in the 50s, and as they did in the 30s, they invited the most important architects or some of the most important architects in, in the world to build a building in Berlin, a residential building in Berlin. And Berlin did this three times. And now Berlin is, uh, is, uh, has a constellation of uh, very important buildings by very important architects built in three periods, in the 30s, in the 50s, and in the 80s. We could do something like this too, to invite architects from uh, you know, all over the world to build, um, let's say, social housing somewhere and create a colony of such buildings. Anyway, this is the building he, uh, he designed, the, the plan uh, of, of the building for Berlin, and you are going to see it. And again, if we look at this plan, we see him. I see his face somehow. You know, it's, 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 it's almost there. It's almost classical. It's almost straight. It's almost okay. But then there is, a, there is something a little bit twisted, a little bit disturbed or disturbing. And, uh, and this is, uh, I guess, this is what, uh, you know, the non-conventional, but then there is, I don't think there is a conventional artist or a conventional architect. I think a true architect or a true, uh, artist or a true writer or a true musician always disturbs a little bit, uh, you know, the status quo. It's it's in the nature of being creative, being a, a, at least a little bit rebellious, you know. And and he was, you know, here. I mean, he could have very easily avoided this, uh, you know, because he didn't have to orient uh, this staircase towards Mecca or anything. No, no, it's, it's his spirit and they like it, you know? I mean, here you have the octagon, um, you know, the entrance hallway and, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's logical, the apartment. Here you have in front of you, you know, the, the, the living room and then uh, two smaller rooms left, right. And here is the bathroom, they are connected. So, you know, it, it almost passes the, the requirements of uh, Ernest Neufert. By the way, Ernest Neufert studied at the Bauhaus, if you can believe it. But there is even a more, a more unbelievable thing about Ernest Neufert, and that is that he loved Antoni Gaudi. Can you believe it? In fact, I feel like writing, or probably was, I imagine it was already written, a book about with this very title, Ernest Neufert and Antoni Gaudi, 
or the other way around, Anthony Gaudi and uh, Ernest Neufer, because they have nothing in common, absolutely nothing. I mean, can you imagine Gaudi, uh, you know, reading uh, the manual uh, of uh, Ernest Neufer? Or can you imagine Ernest Neufer uh, doing, uh, building uh, Sagrada Familia? Although you can find interesting things by uh, Ernest Neufer, he built with his um, the son. This is the building by uh, Hans Holland in, in Berlin. I don't know. I mean, it is, this is, yes, I would say it's, it's we, could, we, we could call it postmodern. Uh, he, he was the victim of that time, and uh, I'm not trying to excuse him, but, but there is still something interesting here. It's not, it's not as disturbing as postmodernism in general could be. No, it, it's discreetly, still kind of discreetly postmodern. He's not afraid to take risks. You, you look at the, you know, the finishes of this part of the building uh, compared to, to what we see here. It's the same building. Uh, a purist, a dogmatic architect would never have something like this. But just like Peter Sir Peter Cook, he is playful. And I think this playfulness deserves attention. And uh, I think very often we are not playful because we restrict ourselves. We are afraid to be playful. It's true, when you are playful, you could also make mistakes, but mistakes sometimes are preferable to, you know, uh, correctness, which leads to total boredom. I think it's better to make mistakes, but be alive than to make no mistakes and be dead, because only if you, when you are dead, you don't make mistakes. Now, this is the building that I refer to, uh, right in the Haas House in Vienna from 1985 to 1990, is right across the, the piazza, the square from uh, St. Stephen's Cathedral. Uh, I don't think it's one of his greatest buildings. It's a commercial building. He tried, maybe he tried too hard. You see his dualities here. You see the rather predictable uh, rhythmicity of these uh, squares. And then, you know, he, he, he tried to bring in uh, certain things together to hold them together somehow. But um, I, I, I think it's not, it's not a great building, but you know, it's right there. And he had the courage to bring, uh, you know, kind of an iconoclastic modernity in a, in, a, in a square which is, uh, you know, uh, surrounded by, uh, you know, historical uh, structures culminating, of course, in the center with St. Stephen's Cathedral. Here it is, the cathedral. So we have commerce and we have God, if, uh, if, we, if we can uh, so simplistically describe, uh, describe everything. Lots of glass, of course, there, there were no concerns then in the 80s with uh, losing energy or paying the bills. They have the money there because not only is Vienna, but it's in the center of Vienna. And, uh, you know, uh, Vienna doesn't even need to work. It can live on tourism or at least um, uh, it, it was able to do so before the pandemic. I like these reflections, these distortions. Distortions are always uh, uh, pleasing. They are about the, the otherness of life, the otherness of, uh, of, uh, of, um, of art, actually. So you see the typical buildings. Oh, by the way, not far away from here, although I didn't visit, it is the foundation Frederick Kiesler. Frederick Kiesler, born in Chisinau. And he lived in Bucharest, and I think he, he had a Romanian citizenship. I have the monograph on Fr Frederick Kiesler, uh, published by the Whitney Museum of Modern Art in New York, where it says Romanian architect living and working in, well, he did in Austria, France, and, and the United States. Strangely, no one talks in Romania about him. And he's without doubt the best known Romanian architect outside of Romania. I mean, he's adored, he's revered by many in the West, while we don't even talk about him. 
Uh, he didn't build a lot, it's true. He didn't even recognize he was Romanian. He said he was Austrian. He was not Austrian. Although, you know, the history at that time, it belonged to the Austro-Hungarian Empire. But I think he had Romanian citizenship. And uh, in fact, uh, a few years ago, I talked to the director of the Kistler Foundation in Vienna, and he told me that he wanted to export a big, uh, uh, a big exhibition, uh, uh, retrospective Frederick Kistler to Bucharest. Why? Well, because Kistler was uh, was Romanian in the sense that uh, he, I think he was a Romanian citizen. He left Bucharest when he was 28 or so. So he was not like Yanis Xenakis, nine years old when he left uh, Braila. Anyway, it's not, it's not about patriotism here, but I still think we should know, you know, since there aren't too many people born around here, you know, who made a splash in the West. And uh, Frederick Kistler did make a splash and, uh, you know, he was honored uh, significantly. You can imagine he has a foundation in Vienna and they, it's very close to the cathedral. I don't know exactly where because I didn't visit it to my shame, but uh, it's maybe even in the shadow of these spires of the St. Stephen's Cathedral. Bravo to Frederick Kistler. Now, Museum für die Moderne Kunst uh, in Frankfurt am Main, 1987-1991. Here it is. Uh, yes, it has some uh, postmodern elements, but it has also the vigor of this, uh, you know, uh, uh, triangular uh, site advancing uh, at the intersection of some major uh, highways or streets. It has force, I would say. And it stands out in comparison with the buildings left and right. It does. Uh, he's, he's a hybrid architect. His architecture, I mean, look, uh, look at this window here, this bow window here, or, uh, you know, these uh, receding things, step things, you know, which make you think of Carlos Scarpa. Uh, maybe he was an architect. I don't know. I, I'm not really an expert in... Uh, Hans Hollein, but it's possible he had, uh, you know, inspirations or influences coming from various places. Um, yes, I, I would describe his architecture as being uh, hybrid, in a way impure, if this uh, word would not alarm uh, the, the, the purist. I think life itself is impure. And, uh, you know, that impurity could be a, a source of richness or uh, it depends how you look at it. So this is in Frankfurt am Main in Germany, a museum by Hans Hollein. I think the interior is a little bit, for my taste, it's not visceral enough, but uh, maybe considering the function, you know, usually museums are like this because we bring in the art and the art is supposed to be the, the spectacle, the, the difference, la différence. But uh, I don't know. I, I, I think Louis Kahn, for example, at the Kimball Museum in Texas, uh, integrated very well art with the building. So the building, even if you remove the art, uh, still had a, a, a warmth, so it was not like this. Here, if you remove the art, you just get white walls and, uh, you know, everything becomes all of a sudden rather, you know, uh, septic. Now, the, this could have been a beautiful work. Unfortunately, it was not built in Salzburg. Uh, Guggenheim, the museum in uh, Mönchsberg in Salzburg, Austria, uh, a great project underground. Um, I, I, I love the, the sketches and the model. Uh, it could have been a very interesting building, but many, many times, unfortunately, great buildings are not being built. I hope, uh, yeah, look, look, look at this section. You know, it's, it's maddening in a way, you know, because again, it's about the otherness of art. And uh, it's, uh, it's um, I, I wrote an essay. Actually, I attended a, a lecture by Hans Hollein at Columbia University in New York many years ago. Of course, he was alive. 
I'm not sure I was alive, but I was there in the auditorium. And after his lecture, I wrote, uh, um, let's call it an essay, something. I wrote something called Apropos of Hans Holland's lecture. If anyone here wants to read it, I could send it to you. Uh, and I, I, at that time, I was in a very negative mode. Uh, maybe not only at that time, but at that time I was drastically negative. And I remember I, 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 I accused him as uh, not being quite a serious architect. And if we look at this section at uh, this curved, you know, uh, thing, uh, you know, penetrating the earth, you know, I think not too many architects would make it like this curved in this way, you know, maybe, you know, it would have been so more natural. I mean, it's unnatural as it is because it's deeply, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, that, 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 that the, the, the penetration of the earth is deep. But why is it like this? Uh, curved. If you look at the plan, it's a different spirit, and I like very much the plan because it's labyrinthical. It's uh, it has a certain uh, geometrical viscerality, but the section the section is shows uh, the idiosyncratic aspects of Hans Holbein, and uh, this drawing uh, it's it's very much him. I, I I like it. I mean, it's 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 sensitive. It's a good drawing. But uh, it, it shows that he was, in my opinion, Hans Hollein was a troubled man. But I, I mean, of course, he's not the only one. Most of us are troubled. Some know it, some don't. But we are all troubled, actually. Why, why, why am I saying most? We are all troubled. Maybe the most troubled are those who think they are not troubled. You know, look at these sections. <laughs> You know, some kind of a you know dark utopia, or I don't, I wouldn't call it a dystopia because it's a museum. But um, I, I like them very much. But uh, anyway, it was not built. Look, he anticipated the cave, the cave revival of the present. I mean, truly, this kind of architecture uh, is very fashionable now. And he anticipated it, you know, uh, 40 years ago. So this man was uh, visionary as well. Maybe himself doubted that side of him, but uh, he was. Another museum, St. Pölden in Austria, 1992, a big one, 1992, uh, 2002. So uh, the construction was uh, finalized 20 years uh, from us. Uh, 20 years ago, and it's a good building. A good building with a variety of things going on here. And look at the sketch. Uh, what is this turbulence here? Again, the rationalist would protest. What is this nonsense here? Well, it's the nervousness of the architect, sir. That's what it is. The architect is not supposed to be nervous, sometimes at least. Uh, okay, maybe that nervousness was only half uh, serious, <clears throat> but uh, interesting things here. <clears throat> what is less interesting is, although it does, but no, I better not comment on this. It's, it's rather ominous, no? Uh, uh, similar scenes I have seen in the, the, the Musée de Confluence, built by his uh, countryman, uh, Wolf Prix. Um, also from Vienna, of course, but built in Lyon. Uh, and I thought in the case of Le Musée de Confluence was a commentary on, uh, on uh, you know, in a way the, the, the tragic uh, output of uh, or consequences sometimes of, of this assault on nature, animals and plants alike. Uh, being done uh, often with the participation of what we call science. What we see here is something else. This, this museum uh, is uh, both, uh, you know, you saw what does this have to do with this? It's the same, it's, it's like a hybrid function of, uh, you know, it's less, uh, it's, yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it's a museum which is not just about art, which is also an interesting idea, I think, to bring in various functions.
Hans Holai, Hans Holai. Now this thing, it, for my taste, is a little bit forced here. You know, yes, it's it's uh, you know it, 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 it's, it's supposed to appear dramatic, but uh, I think it's rather in a decorative way dramatic. But maybe not. Maybe maybe if I visited it, I, I would have had a different opinion. It's possible. But we see the playfulness of the architect, the, the capriciousness of the architect. The, yeah, the, the playfulness is important. I still have some doubts about this surface here. I guess he wanted something to compensate for, to balance the rigidity of these volumes here. And uh, we see his dualities right here in this, in this museum. I don't think he was too idealistic about the uh, life. Um, I, I, I think he had a certain, uh, maybe even bitterness, I think. I don't know. Anyway, uh, a tower in Vienna, 1994, 2000s. Strangely, I have been in Vienna several times and uh, I, I never, when I passed by this building, I never thought it was by him. But it was, and, uh, and it is. And you look here again, it's the same man. You remember that uh, art gallery in New York, an early work where he created that uh, uh, asymmetrical uh, opening into the facade uh, with, with, with some, some, some suggestions of, uh, of symmetry as well. Here, this is forced in a way, but it's a commentary, you know, maybe even a little bit ironical. A commentary on the, in a way, on on the, the ephemerality of uh, even the most, uh, you know, uh, full of certitudes towers. So this problematizes the tower. The tower uh, here in the corner becomes, uh, you know, less sure of itself. And I guess that's perhaps what he wanted to to evoke. You know, again, it's about disruption. It's about, uh, uh, you know, um, being uh, less complacent and wanting to, to belong to the other side as well simultaneously. The Austrian embassy in Berlin, 1996, 2001. I don't know. I mean, yes, sure. But um, yeah, it looks a little bit populist. Uh, I'm glad he uses colors, but um, yeah, in this work, I would say he, he proves himself to be, to an extent at least, a postmodern. At that time, James Sterling also uh, worked in Berlin and built an embassy and so on, and they were affected, it's true. Uh, almost everybody was. Uh, was uh, you know almost ravished, I would say, by postmodernism. But it's possible that uh, you know people in the future would look less crit critically towards postmodernism. I don't know. I, I, uh, this is an interbank headquarters for uh, um, I mean a bank for uh, I mean a bank in Peru in Lima. Uh, you know a commercial structure with big letters interbank. Uh, a proud uh, skyscraper, but it's not uh, it's not uh, uninteresting, uh, you know, uh, sculpturally or architecturally. It's, it's still uh, rather unique. I don't like banks in general <laughs> because I don't like the business. I don't like money, and money doesn't like me. So that's why allow me to go rather quickly through this uh, work in, in Lima by. Um, by Hans Hollein. Centrum Bank in uh, Liechtenstein, 1997-2002. Uh, Again, banks. That's where the money is. What can we do? Uh, but he, because we know by now, uh, you know, these architectonic uh, subtleties, he tried to sabotage a little bit, uh, you know, the, that, that feeling that a uh, bank is always righteous and, uh, you know, straight and so on. 
You see, the building is not straight. I think he was a master of perverse architecture. Uh, and perversity is, of course, uh, morally speaking, uh, uh, questionable, but um, you know, sometimes at least, uh, if they are not pushed too far, they could uh, bring some, uh, you know, uh, spices to uh, aesthetics. If we are to talk just about aesthetics. It's 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 a, it's an interesting building if we look more at it actually. As whole life. Vulcania, European Center of Vulcanology in Auvergne, France. I I like this picture and that's why I I I placed it on the on the on the invitation for today. I, I like this fact that his architecture is hybrid, is, um, has a level of complexity. You know, the, uh, there is a variety of, uh, of uh, spaces and volumes and uh, he's not afraid to take risks. I also like the fact that a building almost becomes, um, you know, a little town or a, a larger settlement. It's not just a building, it's not an object. I mean, it, he, he has a sum of objects, but the, the, the relationship between these objects creates a richer uh, whole. And this whole has, uh, you know, it's an org org organism. It's an organism which is, which is not just a simple sum of uh, dead objects. This aspect, I think, is worth uh, uh, underlining as being positive. That is, there is this uh, urban quality or public quality, even in, you know, uh, private uh, private parts. Even considering private parts of his uh, of his buildings. I mean, it makes one think of, let's say, a medieval town or a medieval city where you have, in time, you know. Uh, uh, um, um, an accumulation of, of various kinds of uh, buildings, usually built uh, over a, you know, a longer period of time. He was able somehow to do this, although he built this building at once, so to speak. In uh, Let's see how many years he built this. Well, five years. But, but many things are going on here. So this is in France. And uh, it seems to re to properly relate him to the name and the function of the building. Vulcanology. Hans Holai. There is also Eros here, of course. I think uh, good art and good architecture cannot uh, completely turn their backs on the very source of life. And Eros often is a result of conflict. I mean, we talk about love, but um, love uh, often uh, is, uh, you know, uh, simultaneously present uh, with uh, what we call conflict. It's, it's, it's both. It's love and war, Eros and Thanatos. He's always surprising. I mean, he has, and this, this, is, this is a beautiful work. It's not a major work. He just did, a, you, you'll see a, a canopy, but everybody in Vienna knows it. And even those who are just uh, tourists, you cannot pass by without noticing it. The Albertina, a great museum, the Albertina Museum Extension, 2001, 2003. Look what he did, you know? Again, you, you say, you know, what is that? You know, why did he do it like this? You know, I, I, again, I think this represents, symbolizes the otherness of art. And look at it, you know, it's, it's a resolute gesture that, that tells you, you have to stop, you have to pay attention. This is a museum, this is an art museum and art is about 
to tell you something that you refuse to acknowledge even when you look in the mirror. This is what art is supposed to do, to show the otherness of, uh, of life, of oneself and so on. And sometimes it is a protest, sometimes it is an enigmatic smile like on the face of Mona Lisa. This is the role of art and that's why we need art. And, and this, you know, uh, canopy, which is clearly, I mean, he, he didn't have a specific reason to, 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 to make it in this way. Again, the functionalists to totally protest, you know, but, but I think Hans Hollein was right. This thing is saying, pay attention to art. We are different. We artists are different. And that's our main force. Uh, you know, the interior is the interior. What can we say? It's fine. It's fine. But I like the, I like the black canopy. An office building in Vienna, Austria, developed. Uh, well, he, <laughs> he obviously liked, liked uh, very much because I saw it also in an earlier work, a smaller version, not like in uh, Albertina. But they all represent the same thing. This, this canopy is the otherness the otherness of the artist, the otherness of the rebellious architect, the otherness uh, that sometimes is appreciated by, uh, by uh, committees and you get the Pritzker Prize. Uh, although I can't see too much of the otherness of Francis Kerr, by the way, his birthday will, uh, will, uh, will pop up in a few days and I am going to dedicate a presentation to him. I, I, I try to be as objective as possible, and I will talk about him with as much affection I, I can find. For the moment, I'm still reticent, now reticent, rather critical of him, but we'll see maybe by, uh, the, I think the 9th of, uh, 9th of uh, April is his birthday. I forgot, but it is in April. Francis Kerr, I would welcome him. Uh, see me, oh God, Taiwan apartment buildings. Look at them. You know, uh, they are Hans Holland. They, they are, you know, regular towers, but then with uh, something different here at the top, of course, the coiffure of the building is where, you know, one uh, is becoming more uh, fanciful. Taiwan apartment buildings, Hans Holland. Not everything is uh, wow. No, Lima again. How come Peru, you know, invited our neighbor Hans Hollein to build there? Romanian could have invited Hans Hollein. It is much closer, no? But it didn't even cross our mind. Not that he is necessarily, you know, the greatest architect ever, but still, you know, you wonder why is it that Peru found the interest in Hans Hollein? and not Romania. Why? Because Peru is not richer than Romania. It's not. So it's not a question of money. It's a question of uh, something else, being curious, being open. Look, now uh, Lima has uh, another building by, uh, by Hans Hollein. Uh, they also have a bank by him and uh, Maybe it's not so little. Okay, now we go to uh, the second architect today uh, that we'll talk about today. A uh, very interesting uh, son of Frank Lloyd Wright who had uh, the, the lack of uh, fortune to have the same name like his father. Uh, and uh, I, I, I don't think it's easy to have a, a father like Frank Lloyd Wright. You know, I, if you are doomed to have such a famous father, there is a good chance that, uh, you know, you'll, you'll start to drink or to do drugs and become depressed because you'll never be great like your father. And it's truly tormenting. And, and, and Frank Lloyd Wright uh, was often Frank Lloyd wrong as his um, apprentices called him, used to call him Frank Lloyd wrong not Frank Lloyd Wright, because he was a short man with Napole a Napoleonic complex, perhaps, 
and uh, he uh, was not shy about uh, his uh, sincere arrogance. So Lloyd Wright, uh, who was actually born uh, on, uh, will be born on the 31st, I think, if I'm not wrong. Uh, yes, we see March 31st, but let's look first at his uh, portrait. I like this man. Now, I don't know if he was short or tall, and it doesn't matter, <clears throat> but I like the expression uh, of, of the man. He, he, he probably suffered. <clears throat> well, he suffered also because his father left him, his mother and left him and left the other children because he got romantically involved with another lady. So he, you know, uh, broke his marriage. So Lloyd, who had the name of his father, Frank Lloyd wrong, uh, Frank Lloyd, sorry, Frank Lloyd Wright Jr. Uh, suffered, I'm sure he suffered, but, but he, he was able to transcend suffering through creativity. And I think we can learn a lot from someone like uh, him. And of course, not only from him. Um, I'm sure it was very difficult and I'm sure he had personality and uh, that personality was, uh, not uh, spoiled by living in the shadow of Frank Lloyd Wright. So let's read a little bit about him, Frank Lloyd Wright. I mean, again, you know, it's not easy, you know, to have the name of such a famous father. Frank Lloyd Wright Jr., uh, March 31st, 1890, May 31st, 1978. Commonly known as Lloyd Wright, so the, the Frank thing was, was dropped, was an American architect, active primarily in Los Angeles and Southern California. He was a landscape architect for various Los Angeles projects, provided the shells for the Hollywood Bowl, which you are going to see, and produced the Swedenborg Memorial Chapel, or Wayfarer's Chapel, at Rancho Palos Verdes, in California, 1946, 1971. His name is frequently confused with that of his more famous father, Frank Lloyd Wright. Of course, it's, of course it is confused if it's exactly the same. If you are lazy to read the, the last two letters, JR, anyway. The Otto Bollmann House, 1922 in Hollywood. Now this is the, the house was built for this beautiful lady. Uh, I, I found this picture, I think was done by uh, uh, Edward Winston, uh, Winston, Winston, a, a very famous photographer. Anyway, she was beautiful, but so is the house that this man, the son of the great Frank Lloyd Wright built. Uh, I couldn't find um, great pictures. I, I found some, but uh, the, the house still exists. But I wouldn't call this, this, this house inferior to the houses built by Frank Lloyd Wright without junior, meaning senior. No, and it's original. Yes, certain parts you can tell had been influenced by, by his father, but I also think Lloyd Wright was an architect on his own with his own ideas and um, I think he was able to, to, to uh, escape the great dangers of uh, you know, dying in the shadow of the big, big tree. If we remember what uh, Constantin Brunku said that uh, in the shadow of the big trees, grass does not grow. Uh, referring to the fact that he turned his back on uh, Auguste Rodin. Um, but uh, you know, Lloyd Wright couldn't turn his back on his father, he couldn't. Uh, uh, but we, it was an interesting relationship because uh, his father even um, employed him to design, um, and you are going to see the landscape around one of his famous villas. He employed him together with Schindler, as I mentioned, uh, to run his office while he was in Japan. Um, uh, yes, even the... He was different from Frank Lloyd Wright Sr., but uh, you see the influence of Frank Lloyd Wright. The plan is not so, uh, you know, uh, interesting in a way, but, but the, the, 
concrete uh, appearance of the house, not, I shouldn't use the word concrete because it, it refers to the material. The, the, the building uh, in its uh, physical manifestation is more interesting actually than, than the plan seems to be rather predictable and, and, and static, but the building as built doesn't seem to be so. Here it is an auction of the building uh, the view spot of Hollywood, beautiful hilltop residence of Mr. Otto Bollmann. Uh, I don't even know if the name of the architect is mentioned. Um, anyway, he was, uh, he, um, Lloyd uh, Wright uh, also worked uh, in Hollywood and apparently he ran uh, the, the department of uh, stage design uh, for uh, the Paramount uh, Studios. He, had, he was very well connected. I don't know if be, only because of his father, the fame of his father. No, I think it was because of his uh, own uh, qualities and talents and ability to connect with, with other people. This is a great house, the Martha Taggart house from 1922, 1924. So 100 years ago, he built this, uh, this house which is different from what Frank Lloyd Wright did. Uh, someone who knows uh, well uh, the works of Frank Lloyd Wright can see the difference between what Lloyd Wright did and um, you know, uh, the famous uh, uh, Frank Lloyd Wrong. It's not a bad building. Uh, and yes, he had the luxury to build for uh, you know, well-to-do clients from Hollywood, uh, but uh, I, I think he served architecture in a distinctive way, in a noble way, and he, he deserves our applauses. I, I, it's very possible Frank Lloyd Wright Sr. or Frank Lloyd Wrong understood the talents of his son if he uh, invited him to run his own office while he was in Japan, and that is for two years. So this is by Lloyd Wright. And uh, very often in his works, the landscape shows care and creativity. And even here it shows, you know, the plants that were chosen. These were chosen by a man who knew something about horticulture, who knew something about landscape design and who had the, the, the necessary talent. I truly think this kind of architect today would be very uh, necessary even. An architect who is, uh, uh, well, yes, an architect, but, or a landscape architect, but also a, a gardener, you know, not to say, well, landscape architect, but I, I prefer kind of more modest wording, the gardener, the one, the one who works with the plants, a horticulture, to, to hold horticulturalist, culturalist, it doesn't sound quite right, but you understand from horticulture, the word, the, the work with plants and for the plants, with plants is important. It's very, very important. But what is also important, I think, and uh, I feel tempted to speculate, is that he also worked with the film industry. I hate the word industry, but with films. With, with people from the seventh art. So if we can combine architecture with the seventh art and with the work, with the world of plants, with horticulture, with landscape design, just imagine, you know, juggling with the three, you know, it, the, the, there are provocations that are quite interesting. The artificiality of the film and then the naturalness of, uh, of uh, plants you know, the earth, you have the earth and then you have the projections of the seventh art and then you have architecture in between. Uh, there are interesting uh, tensions there, interesting contradictions. Uh, this is the only picture I found with uh, some furniture designed by him. Uh, they are a little bit burlesque, the, 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 you know, the, the, the chairs, the thrones, they have something of Frank Lloyd Wright, but they're also different. I would have never said that these are by Frank Lloyd Wright, but they could very well be by his son's, uh, son. And indeed they are by his son. 
anyway, back to this um, this uh, famous actually house by uh, Lloyd Wright, and I'm so happy I discovered him because I mean that I be I began to study him because I uh, before I just knew his name, but I didn't uh, study his work. I think his work is is is, is interesting. you know, 100 years ago. Yes, it was refurbished. Yes, I'm sure those who live here take care of all, of all the plants and the design elements. Sure, because it's a famous building and, uh, you know, uh, only a well-to-do. In fact, you are going to see a little bit later how the, uh, you know, the, I'm not good at this uh, with these words, but a, a very important member of the Pritzker family bought one of the houses built by uh, Lloyd, uh, Lloyd Wright. We are going to arrive at that. But if I look at this picture, I see the architect and I see the landscape architect and they are the same man, the same person. It's clear that he loved landscape design, landscape architecture. This is not, this does, didn't grow like this, you know, uh, God's way. No, here is the work of man, is the work of the landscape designer. He also worked with the great, great Frederick Olmsted, uh, truly the, 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 the landscape designer or the landscape architect of uh, Central Park in Manhattan and uh, Prospect Park in Brooklyn and many, many, many other truly uh, uh, the proteic uh, force in landscape architecture in the United States. So uh, Lloyd um, uh, Wright uh, worked with him. I, I love this picture because the architecture has dignity, is cultural, is interesting, but so is the landscape design and they, they collaborate. They are distinct, they are different and then and yet they, 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 they work together well, and they work together well because the same man took care of both. You see, you know, he, he loved the, the baroqueness of, uh, of, of, of nature. You know, these are not, uh, of course, uh, these plants are probably, uh, you know, even expensive if I am to think of such matters, but you know, they, they, they complement the building in, uh, with their own drama and beauty. Uh, Henry Bowman House, uh, this one, um, I only have, I think, three pictures. I couldn't find some, sometimes it's difficult to find pictures with his work because every time you type in uh, Lloyd Wright or Frank Lloyd Wright Jr., you come across the pictures of uh, his father. This is the fatality of having the name of your father. But I was still able to, to gather images for this presentation. He is a little bit different from Frank Lloyd Wright. He's not just a pallid, uh, you know, uh, multiplication of his father. Now, now, on one hand, he seems to have a, a different kind of urbanity. You know, it's, it's, a, it's an urban building. I mean, yes, it is surrounded by trees, you know, it's it's a clean box in a way, but then he comes with the landscape design around it, and so you have this uh, this um, this uh, you know conjunction between the the richness and the expressivity expressivity of nature and the simplicity of geometry. Uh, I mean, if if you make abstraction of what's going on here and here you almost get a building by Adolf Loos, uh, almost. So this is something with, which Frank Lloyd Wright Sr. would not have done. But um, I, I think, uh, I think uh, Lloyd Wright uh, was a, a very interesting architect with his own ideas and not just living uh, in a parasitical way uh, uh, in the shadow of his father. Uh, the interior was, of course, uh, refurbished. Uh, I don't know if 100 years ago there were such refrigerators. Uh, you know, you could, 
just like in the models of Frank Gehry, you can enter the refrigerator. And when uh, the climate warming keeps warming, you can find refuge. In. It became a room, actually. Landscape design for the Miller House. The Miller House, an important building by Frank Lloyd Wright from his textile series. So his father, I guess, invited him to do the landscape design. And I actually, the landscape design is beautiful. 1923, five years before uh, the Placid Villa Savoie by Le Corbusier was built. I was malicious now, of course, but really that uh, Villa Savoie maybe, no, no, Bernard Schumi was too, uh, too malicious uh, himself when he said when the building was falling apart because of neglect, he said the most architectural thing ab about Villa Savoie is the, sa is the state of decay it is in. But this Miller house by uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, look at the landscape. I think the landscape is even better than the building. It's beautiful. It's simple, it's modest, it's, it has irregularities, it's poetical. I think uh, Lloyd Wright was a, was a very good uh, inspired landscape architect, very sensitive. Uh, truly, it matters. And, and I truly think uh, when a project in school is done, usually nobody thinks about what's around the building. We only think about the building. But what if, what if you start the other way? What if you have, let's say, a plot of land and you have to do a house? And instead of starting with a house and then uh, if you still have energy and time and inspiration and maybe money, think about the garden, why not start with the garden? Start with oxygen, not with sabotaging oxygen. Oxygen. The garden brings in oxygen. The building erodes it. So maybe it's time to start with the garden and then make the building to match the garden. Right now, very few students in architecture, I think, uh, pay any attention to the space around the building and uh, maybe even very few architects we only think of the building but i think the landscape design is immensely important especially now when we complain about the climate change and uh, pollution and all the rest i he did a, 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 a great landscape design and I, I feel it is more sensitive than the building itself done by his father father and son, this is also an interesting theme. Then you, we have the two Sarinan, Eliel Sarinan and Eero Sarinan, and we have uh, Jean uh, Chumi and Bernard Chumi. Here we have Frank Lloyd Wright and Frank Lloyd Wright again, Junior, or Frank Lloyd Wright and Lloyd Wright. I really don't know what was in the mind of uh, Frank Lloyd wrong when, well, he was wrong when he named his son with the very same name. I love this picture, you know, it's, it's architecture, then it's uh, non-architecture, meaning uh, nature, and nature is not, is not, you know, domesticated, it's allowed to, to be free, you know, uh, the presence of the human hand or the human thinking or the human imagination is discreet as it should be. I mean, I'm not at all against uh, André Le Nôtre. I love André Le Nôtre, who had very different ideas about landscape design. But I also like very much Lloyd, uh, Lloyd Wright. I do. I think he was a very sensitive landscape architect, but also a good architect. We look, we are approaching the end of the, of the presentation. 1923, 1925, Oasis Hotel, uh, Palm Springs. Uh, no, no, actually, <laughs> we still have a few more images to show. I, I couldn't find great pictures with this. Uh, it was a part of it was demolished, uh, if I remember, partially raised. Well, that's a more brutal word for being demolished, or I don't know which one is more, uh, more brutal. Um, this happens. What can we do, even with great buildings? Frank Lloyd Wright himself lost great buildings because of this. Uh, Anyway, sad, very sad. When the bulldozer is trusted more than the genius of uh, an architect uh, who put his soul into a building. 
Uh, this is a rendering. Uh, it's 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 a compromised building, but I like this picture, you know, with this entrance here. It's actually very interesting, a very interesting idea, and he used it in some other place where where the opening into the world does take place, and then at the top you have this dramatic uh, rift, you know, which dramatizes uh, the entrance. The Harry and Alice Car House, 1925. Um, he built several houses. Some of them are still uh, uh, functioning uh, properly, but I couldn't find pictures for all of them. This one is not so special. Probably it was uh, also modified in time. It's possible. Not all his works are truly great. This one, though, is a masterpiece. The John Soden House. Let's uh, read it again. John Soden House, 1926. Two years younger than Villa Savoie uh, near Paris. But look at this. You know, uh, first look at the landscape. It's uh, it's uh, it's brilliant. Yes, it's baroque. It's theatrical. Nature doesn't work in this way. Here you have heterogeneous uh, plants brought together by the will of man. But it's an artistic well. It's a sensitive well. It's also uh, a dramatic will. And, and uh, the building, just like uh, the one we saw previously, is dramatic at the entrance. It's a box with a rift. It was cut in two. And exactly where the cut took place, it's the sculptural wound of the building, if I, if I am to call it so. I like this building very much. And I'm sure Hollywood likes it too, because uh, you know, they made movies there. And I find I, I'm, I'm, I'm an adversary of Hollywood, maybe, maybe wrongly. It's possible that wrongly. But I love film. I love good films. Uh, I, I love the, uh, not because I'm a, I'm a snob, but I, I love great uh, directors in film. I love film. I think film can inform architecture. Well, architecture informs film as well. One of the greatest uh, film directors, Eisenstein, studied architecture, and uh, I, I, I think film can can inform with its otherness, with its artificiality, can inform architecture beautifully. Now look here; there are very interesting things happening. Um, uh, yes, this picture maybe is a little bit maybe because of the color scheme. Who knows? Uh, the, that blueness of the of the of the water is of the swimming pool is uh, alarmingly alarmingly blue. But um, I have the feeling it's a very interesting building. Maybe the furniture is not so interesting, but I don't think uh, I don't know if uh, I don't know if uh, this architect Lloyd Wright was uh, the one who prescribed that furniture. He prescribed the building and he prescribed the landscape uh, around the building. But it's a good building. And it was not designed by Frank Lloyd Wright, but by Frank Lloyd Wright Jr. I have a picture with some projections because these are invited. I mean, let's not forget this is in Hollywood and this is a screen. OK, let's bring in the projector and let's project uh, the same film or two films simultaneously. Uh, it's very inviting and exciting. Um, it's monumental. It's also domestic. This is, I imagine, from a film. It cannot be from real life because it's it's, it's just too it's too good to be true. But uh, it's interesting, you know. Really, the building is interesting, and the the, the photograph is interesting, and uh, you know, it, it gives you hope that life can be interesting, can be you know, enjoyable. And the landscape and the plants add to the, add to the show uh, themselves. He is different. The more I look, he is different from, from his father. And I think his work as a landscape architect um, helped him, uh, uh, you know, uh, individualize himself vis-a-vis -vis his, uh, his uh, you know, uh, how to call him, how to call Frank Lloyd Wright. Again, it's not easy to have a father like Frank Lloyd Wright. No. 
now because you are condemned to uh, to be less and uh, no one likes that feeling look at these uh, stones how they are you know carved Again, it is, this is an interesting architect, you know, who had his own ideas, who didn't reject the theater as a distinct art, who didn't reject nature and who didn't reject architecture. So you have the plants, we are looking at the plants. Now there is an esoteric, esoteric, you know, eso from esoteric, perhaps, I don't know, tourist, the Southern House. The Southern House, uh, a famous house in Hollywood by Lloyd Wright. I love these plants. Of course, they are dramatic. Of course, they are theatrical. But so is the building. Quite an entrance into the building. Now, of course, it's not for everybody, this building. It's not for proletarians. It's not for, it's for people well-to-do who can afford to live like this. Here it is, a, a rare look inside the Black Dahlia murder house. Welcome to Hollywood. It's possible that this was a film. In fact, we could even search for it, you know, made in this house. There are other houses by, well, by his father, I know of one of them where, you know, uh, films took place and, uh, you know, John Lautner also, another interesting architect, uh, you know, special houses turned up the imagination of the Hollywood producers and the spectacular architecture helps to sell your, your movie, of course. A rare look inside the Black Dahlia murder house. Murder in the in the um, uh, Lloyd uh, wrong, uh, Wright uh, house. What is projected there from scenes, from paintings? Um, interesting, interesting. An interesting building, an interesting uh, opulence, you know, because it is about opulence, but it's about really excellence, you know, an aspiration, you know, it's, it's you want to escape the banality of a life that is just that banal and uh, yes yeah, sometimes uh, money helps sometimes uh, money uh, doesn't help uh, but uh, with imagination and artistry you arrive at interesting things lloyd wright home his own home i only found one picture and not a great picture at all i I divided it in uh, three segments, but it's only one picture. I couldn't find other, others. <laughs> because when I typed in Lloyd, Lloyd Wright or Frank Lloyd Wright Jr. Uh, home, always popped up the studio in Oak Park uh, of his father. So I couldn't find um, more than just this picture I found with his own house, the Lloyd Wright's uh, house. And uh, <laughs> You know, I, it's the same picture, but I show it uh, different uh, resolutions. That's all. But we still see the landscape designer. In fact, you know, he used the vertical forest. Well, it's not really a forest because it's a horizontal building, but he placed, uh, you know, uh, green vegetable material on the, on the facade of the building. Uh, that is almost 100 years ago. And then he has a textile, uh, work inspired by his father, uh, and that's it. And now we go to uh, another very interesting house from 1928. Again, 1928, the year when Le Corbusier built his famous Villa Savoie. But now we look at this building built exactly in that year by Lloyd Wright, the son of Le Corbusier's uh, enemy, so to speak, Frank Lloyd Wright or Frank Lloyd Wright. It's a beautiful building actually by Lloyd Wright, uh, you know, and different from the buildings by, by uh, his father. Uh, we begin with some details, but um, as a whole, it's, it's a very charming and uh, even monumental building. An interesting, another building built by this architect uh, who is not so well known, but he deserves, I think, to be well known.
this one was bought by uh, Pritzker. Uh, we are, you, are, you are going to see a picture um, of that um, important member of that so-called important, well, maybe I should say so-called, although I'm a little bit mad at them that they gave the Pritzker to Francis Kerr, but who knows? Maybe he was the best out of the lot. I don't know. Um, now look at this, you know, this, this was obviously, uh, you know, uh, crafted uh, doctor, I felt like saying doctor by Lloyd Wright, but it's impressive, you know, this, uh, he created this uh, drama, this conflict between nature and architecture. It is clear that he loved both. Is the work of man and the work of God, or the God, the, the work of nature? You know, when when his father, Frank Lloyd Wright, senior, was asked, "Do you believe in God?" He said, "I do, but I spell it nature." So it's possible that Lloyd Wright, uh, you know, did receive something through the blood, through the DNA, uh, from his father. It's also very possible that Lloyd Wright was not uh, always very happy about his father because after all, his father left his family, left the mother of Lloyd Wright. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't think Lloyd Wright appreciated very much this, but they uh, collaborated later on. Pritzker, this word science, science <laughs> almost sounds like science, S-C-I-O-N buys Lloyd Wright's iconic Samuel Novaro house. So now it belongs to the Pritzker family or to this person that you are going to see here. This young man is the owner, owner of this uh, important building by uh, Lloyd Wright. And a touch of, uh, you know, artist, artistry in the field of uh, landscape design. Uh, yeah, an exotic uh, tree there. Now the Hollywood Bowl shells, we are approaching the end. He built three, uh, three or two from 1926 to 1928. The first one was considered so ugly that it was destroyed. Then he built another one. Um, the first one, the first Hollywood uh, Bowl from 1927 was this one. I couldn't find, it was destroyed, but even the second one was destroyed. Uh, there are these pictures from 1920, whatever, 1927. It was considered too, too ugly. Uh, I read about it. Uh, it's, a, it's, you know, it's a stage uh, for, uh, you know, concerts and all kinds of events 100 years ago. Look, uh, for a huge number of people, maybe the Oscars, would have been uh, how uh, you know received here i don't know but uh, i don't think it, it is ugly but you know the people at that time thought so uh, they demolished it and he built a new one a curved one and we are going to see that one as well you see here in 1926 i don't know if he built this one he built the one in 1927 then in 1928 and in 1929, maybe this one was an evolution or a development of this one. This one has something of uh, Le Duan Boulet. There is a certain utopianism here. So from 1927 to 1929, but they, they, it has been destroyed. Uh, it's interesting though, how abrupt and how huge this is. I mean, just try to imagine attending uh, an event here, a theater performance, a, a musical a concert, something, you know, an event. It, imagine being here, you know, uh, quite dramatic. But uh, yes, the landscape itself, the natural landscape is dramatic. Too bad it was destroyed, sitting for 20,000 people. Lloyd Wright, Hollywood, California. Remarkable. Uh, here is another picture, the Hollywood Bowl in 1930. I don't know when this was destroyed. 
Now, the Joshua Tree retreat from 1946-1957, so after the war, I will read something interesting here. <clears throat> uh, right now, <clears throat> is the Institute of Mental Physics. I like this work, which was artificially produced. It was dreamed up by the British journalist Edwin Dingle, whose travels through China and Tibet led him to change his name to Ding Le Mei and found the found the Institute of Mental Physics. So not metaphysics, but mental physics. Interesting. But in a way, you know, between metaphysics and mental physics, there is a relationship. Uh, Lloyd White built a building. Uh, is less spectacular than the world itself, mental physics. But it's still, uh, you see uh, an influence coming from Frank Lloyd White, the building with, with, from Thaliès and West, <clears throat> the, the second home studio of Frank Lloyd Wright. Yeah, it's clear there was an influence coming from his father, uh, but the landscape still belongs to, to uh, Lloyd Wright. So he built all this building here. Uh, this uh, Institute of uh, Mental Physics. This is interesting, uh, you know, strangely, I lived for many years in the United States. I never went to California, but it's not just about California. Maybe, um, maybe uh, that uh, Romanian poet who resides in the United States, uh, who is actually from Sibiu, he was right when he said the most pragmatic people in the world, that is the North Americans, they could also be the most poetical or even spiritual. It's a strange combination and I don't understand it actually, you know, that, that exactly when you are the most mercantile and, and pragmatic, you become also poetical and utopian, you know, like, you know, think about the Institute of Mental Physics, you know, mental physics, you know, but it's true, you know, and anything goes really there. It's, it's the country of possibilities still. You know, Frank Gehry ran away from Canada, Canada to go to Los Angeles, to go to the Western coast of the United States. Um, of course, now with sustainability, ecology, uh, pollution, uh, uh, melting of the icebergs, the rising level of the seas and so on, uh, the war in uh, Ukraine and all the problems we are confronted Maybe the flamboyance of the North American spirit uh, can be questioned and should be questioned. But still, you know, they stir us up. Uh, I mean, this very Zoom that we are using now comes from there. The laptop I am using, yeah, it comes from there. You know, they, it's, it's this unsettled spirit that they continuously, uh, you know, give birth to new things, the brave new world. I ran away from. Okay, back to Lloyd Wright and his um, campus for the mental physics. Um, not a very dramatic architecture, but maybe this was the requirement of his um, by now uh, half Chinese, half Tibetan uh, client. Uh, this is a more uh, tempered version of the Thaliès and West by his father. The Dorland House, 1949 in uh, California. Um, yeah, a house, maybe not very spectacular, but uh, not totally without interest if we contemplate particularly this corner. And yes, the plants, he seemed to like certain plants as we can see here. Um, this is the plan of the, of the house different from what uh, his father would do, 28 feet by 13 feet, uh, living room and dining room. You enter directly into, the, into, the, into the, this large space from here. Two bedrooms, not a big deal. <laughs> if we are to, to express, if I am to express myself in a rather questionable or vulgar way, uh, I like the ceiling, you know, the ceiling and the roofing 
system. It makes me think of some other architectures, you know, even Louis Kahn, but this one is more flat, but still interesting, you know, uh, faceted. You know, it's, uh, there is some fractal geometry at work here. I, I, I like uh, I like uh, I like uh, this corner, and I have a picture, a better picture with it. It's not bad. The space is interesting. Uh, you know, uh, maybe the furniture. I mean, I'm most I'm sure the furniture was uh, changed in uh, you know seventy years or so. So, a house by uh, Lloyd uh, Wright. I just read the other day that in Japan, <clears throat> they think that uh, the architecture of Japan, which is of course very famous and celebrated, is mostly about the roof. And indeed the roof is very, very important. And the one we, are pay, we will pay homage tomorrow, Zaha Hadid, uh, probably would have agreed with the Wolf Pricks who said there are architects who are architects of the basement, and he gave us an example, Raymond Abraham, then architects of the middle part of the building, and he gave us an example, uh, uh, Stephen Hall, and then architects of the roof or roofing, and he gave himself as a, an example, and Saha Hadid. Uh, here we see also the significance of the roof. The roof is the coiffure of the building. It protects the head of the building. It protects the building, but it also expresses, in a way, uh, the personality of the building, the, the aspirations of the building. Uh, so yes, the roof is very, very important. Now, this chapel, and with this I end this presentation uh, on uh, Lloyd Wright. It's also called the uh, Swedenborgian uh, Chapel because it's dedicated to a uh, you know, spiritualist uh, movement relating to the great uh, Swedish mystic Swedenborg. Uh, apparently Swedenborg, I, I, I have this quotation from Daniel Lipskin. Daniel Lipskin quoted Swedenborg who apparently said that the more uh, uh, angels in, in, in the sky, the more space. So again, Swedenborg, for whom this chapel was built by Lloyd Wright, apparently said, I, I read this from Daniel Lipskin, that the more angels there are in, uh, in, in the sky, the more space. So let's look at this chapel from 1951. Uh, the Swedenborgian chapel, I have a few words about it. It's a very important work by him. Wayfarer's Chapel, also known as the Glass Church, an indoor-outdoor structure made almost entirely of glass and built in 1951 for the Swedenborgian Church, overlooking the Pacific Ocean on the Palos Verdes Peninsula. The site planning and planting design express his talent meaning Lloyd Wright's, an experience as a landscape architect. He had an embracing grove of redwoods, uh, sequoia, semperverance, plenty to achieve this. The Wayfarer's Chapel is listed in the National Register of Historic Places. When the trees that surround the chapel grow up, they will become the framework that already happened, become a part of the tree forms and branches that inevitably arise from the growing trees adjacent to it. I use the glass so that the natural growth, the sky, this is the statement of the architect, uh, and see beyond became the definition of the environment. Natural growth, the sky, and sea, the sea beyond. This is done to give the congregation protection in services and at the same time to create the sense of outer as well as inner space. This is the statement of someone, of course, very sensitive to plants, to flowers, to nature, but also sensitive and desiring of architecture. This is how the building looked before the trees grew. And even before the trees grew is, I think, impressive. Very different from the works of his father, a chapel built 
for the one who said, the more angels in the sky, the more space. And here it is when the building is receiving Nietzsche, nature, <laughs> Nietzsche, Nietzsche, nature is receiving the trees. Uh, it's a very nice work. Uh, and uh, again, the one who said that architecture is about dreaming was right. It is about dreaming. My well, life itself is a dream. Uh, and uh, if we neglect to, to acknowledge this truth, we neglect the best part of life, actually, and of architecture and of creativity. Life is a dream. Yevgeny mine, as a Russian poet said, space and time do not exist as um, another great uh, Swede uh, said, uh, not Swedenborg, but Strindberg. Strindberg quoted by a great, 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 great film director, Ingmar Bergman. Since we are now uh, close to Hollywood, we have to we have to mention Ingmar Berman. Yes, in Fanny and Alexander, a beautiful film, which I strongly recommend to you if you didn't see. Uh, at one moment, someone says quotes from, uh, from Strindberg, the great uh, Swedish uh, writer, space and time do not exist. Nature and architecture, architecture and nature together. Thank you.